I want to be very sensitive to him today. Slip up your hand to the Lord. God, we praise you and we bless you. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You heal hearts, God. standing with me if you want to turn in your Bible or maybe pull it up on your phone to Matthew 24 that's where we'll be going I share this just purely as a guess a faith builder today it's certainly not about an event but it's good when people are are hungry there are people in the room today who drove from Harlan County to be in here in worship, be in the Lord's presence. There are also people in the room who drove from Lexington purely to be here and in the house of the Lord, God's presence to worship. Now, I am well aware there are also people in Corbin too sorry to get up and drive across town to be here. I, I realize that. But, uh, you know, when some of that's happening, God's doing something. And that's good. And we thank God for that. And we rejoice in that. Amen. I have, um, I have a message on my heart this morning. <clears throat> Look with me in Matthew chapter 24. And we'll begin reading at verse 32. Matthew 24, 32. These are the words of Jesus. He said, Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. I want to preach with the Lord's help, with His touch this morning, on the sign of the fig tree. The sign of the fig tree. Pray with me. God, I thank You. You have gathered us together in Your name in this place, and we sense Your presence. Lord, I pray that you've touched the individual heart today. You knew exactly who'd be here. They may not have even known it way in advance, but you did. And God, I pray that you'd touch me and speak through me today. Lord, I don't care about anybody seeing me, but I do want them to see you. And it doesn't matter whether they hear me, but it does matter whether they hear you. God, I pray that you'd speak through me today. Lord, there's an anointing that destroys bondage. There's a touch of God that sets people free. And I pray for that today. And I pray that we'd be yielded to you, Lord, and that you would bring transformation in lives by the power of your Spirit. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you and you may be seated. The sign of the fig tree. <clears throat> now, if you are familiar at all with Matthew 24, you know what it's about. Matthew 24, really that whole chapter, are, holds the words of Jesus himself about the end times. Hallelujah. 
And uh, Matthew 24 is all about the end times and the last days. And uh, the words of Jesus himself about that. And he gives in that chapter a variety of signs, signs of the times, he calls them, that when you see these things happening, Jesus said, it's a sign that you will know that my coming is soon. Jesus came the first time we celebrated at Christmas. He came as a baby in a manger, but he's coming again. He's coming in two phases, the rapture of the church to take us home to heaven to be with him, and then seven years later, he's coming back to judge his enemies and to reign victoriously on the earth. There will be seven years of tribulation on the earth during that time. But Jesus came the first time as a baby in a manger. But Jesus is coming again. I said Jesus is coming again. It's the hope of the church and you better be ready. Because just as surely as he came the first time, he's coming again. But he gives a number of signs and I'll mention several of those here in a minute. But one of the signs that he gives is the sign of the fig tree. We just read that scripture. It's the sign of the fig tree. Now quite often in scripture, the fig tree is the symbol of Israel. Quite often the fig tree is the symbol of Israel. You see that in Hosea 9 and 10 and in other places that the fig tree is the symbol of Israel. So when he gives the fig tree, he's talking about Israel. Now, as we have seen in the last few days, the, the last week or so, we see again the rising, and maybe to a level we've not seen before, the rising of hostility against Israel. Folks, from the beginning, from the Old Testament, God chose Israel as his people. They rejected him. And he extended mercy to the Gentiles. That's us. These last 2,000 years have been the church age. Thank God that we've got an opportunity to come in. To find him. Thank God. But he's not done with Israel yet. But because, because before this thing winds up, they may have rejected him, but he never rejected them. And he's coming back to deal with Israel again. And so when Jesus, and to draw them to him before he's done. And so when Jesus gave the sign of the fig tree, his point was, one of the primary signs of the times was, when you see stuff happening with the fig tree, when you see stuff going on with Israel, he said, understand, that's a sign of the time. My coming is near. I'm about to split the eastern sky and return to take my people home to be with me. When you see stuff going on with the fig tree, when you see stuff going on with Israel, it's the sign of the fig tree that we are near the return of the Lord. Now, <clears throat> we've seen the rising hostility of the nations against Israel. And, and beyond that, did you know Friday, this past Friday, was Israel's birthday. Her, the anniversary of Israel becoming a nation was May 14th, 1948, and that Israel celebrated 73 years as a nation this, this past Friday. And so we are reminded as we see these things of the sign of the fig tree when that was Jesus' primary point. When you see things going on with the fig tree, when you see things going on with Israel, you'll know that my coming is near. And then he makes this statement. He says, in fact, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. What in the world does that mean? This generation, what was he talking about? This generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. And he goes on to say, and we quote this quite often, this verse, but 
I, I, I'm reminded of it when you put it in its context. We love to quote that verse, heaven and earth will pass away. I want to tell you folks, that's literally going to happen because one of these days there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth what we know will pass away. The elements, Peter said, the elements will melt with a fervent heat and there'll be a new city come down from God out of heaven. This, the heaven and earth that we know will pass away. He said heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. And even in the midst of all the chaos of the end times and all of the upheaval, he said you can bake on this. What I said is going to take place even when heaven and earth will pass away. My word will still stand. <clears throat> now, there are about Three primary ways to interpret what he said. When he said, this generation, keep your eye on the fig tree, on Israel, and this generation, because when you see things happening there, my coming is near. <clears throat> but he said, this generation will not pass away until these things take place. What did he mean by that? There are about three possible interpretations. The first one is this, and this is the one that I tend to lean toward. The first possible interpretation of that is, because he prophecy sometimes can apply on multiple levels, but the first possible interpretation is that when the generation comes that starts seeing all these signs intensifying that I've told you about. And when you read through the first portion of Matthew 24, especially about verses 4 through 14, he lists a bunch of signs. He says, he says in the last days, there will be widespread deception. He said, there will be earthquakes and famines and wars. He said there will be an increase of crime and violence. Come on. That lawlessness will abound. That there will be an increase of violence and crime. But he also said along with all those things, the earthquakes and the wars and, and, and all of that stuff, there will also be an increased spread of the preaching of the gospel. He fa in fact, he said the gospel will be preached in every nation before I return. And so perhaps what he was saying was, when you get to that generation, we've, we've always seen some of that to a measure. But he said when you get to that generation, that you see all of those things start stepping up, start increasing, and start intensifying all over the place, and you see all of that happening, wars and rumors of wars and, and violence and crime and, and as well as the gospel being spread and deception, and you see all of that stuff intensifying and going to another level and beginning to take place. He said, I'm not going to drag it out. There'll be troublesome times. There'll be perilous times. But it won't last forever because when all of that really starts intensifying, before that generation is over, I'm going to split the eastern sky and come back to take my people home to be with me. We see stuff around us and it's scary or it can be if we let it be. But he said... When you see all of, when, when there's that generation that really starts seeing all of this intensifying in a way that you've never seen before, no, that generation will not pass away. I won't let it go on forever. I will return to fulfill my purpose. And so if we interpret it that way, what is the lesson? Because I'm, I'm going to give you each of these interpretations of what he meant, possible interpretations, and the lesson for us. And the lesson for us is this. Don't be afraid. Don't hang your head. Don't be discouraged. Don't hang your head down. In fact, look up. 
Because he said, he said, give me my scripture in Luke 21. He said, now when these things begin to happen, look up, lift up your head, because your redemption draws near. Hallelujah. Your redemption draws near. Complete redemption. You see, here's what we often, I don't have a lot of time to go into this, but here's what we often don't understand about salvation and redemption. Here's what the scripture teaches. Because we talk about when I got saved. You know, at whatever age, whatever time that was, however many years ago or whatever, on this day I came to an altar, I knelt in prayer, I asked the Lord to come into my heart, They counted me that I got saved, and we believe in all of that. But here's what Scripture teaches. I was saved. I am being saved. And one of these days, I will be completely saved. And there will be a transformation The Bible said in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, that the corruptible will put on incorruption and the mortal will put on immortality. And the saying will be true, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? Somebody praise him. So he says, when you, this, that generation won't pass. When you get to that point, don't, that you're seeing all this stuff happen in a way that you have never seen before. In fact, the Bible says in another place that before some of those end time events that there'd be a great falling away. I don't have time to go into all of it, but part of what that means is not just the church, though we've got plenty of falling away in the church But part of what he was talking about was a complete revolt of the world system against anything to do with God or any any godly traditions, any any, any godly framework, a complete revolt of the world against that. And that's what we're seeing right now. But he said, when you see that, when you see that stuff, he said, don't hang your head. Look up. Your redemption, my salvation is closer than it's ever been. Hallelujah. Your redemption is drawing near. Somebody praise him. Bless the name of the Lord. (coughs) Don't be afraid. Don't hang your head. Look up. Here's a second possible interpretation. This generation will not pass away until all these things come to pass. Perhaps he's referring to that generation at that time. It won't, it won't last forever. It won't be dragged out. Jesus will come. Be encouraged. But secondly, some scholars believe that when he said this generation, everybody say generation. When he said this generation will not pass away till all these things happen, that it was a reference, and it can be in some places, to the Jewish race. That he was saying, how many of you know, folks, Israel's been under fire for a long time. For centuries. The devil hates them. And they've been under fire for a long time. And for years they weren't even in existence in a nation. And what happened in 1948 for Israel to be restored as a nation, that had never happened before. The world had never seen anything like that before. A a, a nation was born in a day. Amen. It was in many ways the fulfillment of Ezekiel 37 in what looked like a valley of dry bones and there was no way it could come together but when God's moment came, it came together. And Jesus was saying, my people are not going away. Israel, is this generation will not end. They're going to be around. Now Paul picks up this same thing. If you'll take me to this next passage of Scripture in Romans 11, beginning at verse 1, Paul said, I say then, God has not cast away his people. Certainly not. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, 
of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. God has not rejected Israel. They rejected him. They rejected Jesus as Messiah, but he's not rejected them. Because this is what happens when you skip down to verse 25 of Romans 11. This is what it says. We're going there. Verse 25. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has, has come in. They've been blinded and hardened for a while, allowing me and you to come in. Come on. But God's not done. Look at verse 26. He said they've been temporarily blinded and hardened. But he said all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Somebody praise the name of the Lord. That's part of the reason the psalm said pray for the peace of Jerusalem. The reason you and I should be praying for Israel and praying for Jerusalem. We want them to be protected, but most of all, we want them to be saved. We want them to see Jesus, their Messiah, for who he is. That's what we're praying for more than anything. And everything you see on the news, and in case you hadn't noticed, the news is biased. They're lying through their teeth. And every time you see something on the news, you ought to breathe a prayer. He said, I want you to pray for Israel. The only reason you and I got here is because God was merciful. When they rejected him, he turned to us and gave us an opportunity. And we were grafted in and thank God for it. But Paul said, you better turn right back around and pray for the people of Israel, not only for their protection, but for them to see Jesus for who he is. So we pray for revival in Israel, and it will come. For some, for some of them, it may take going through the tribulation, but they will. Co- it, it will come. You say, Pastor, what's the lesson for us? Now look at look at verse twenty nine. He's talking about Israel, but this is what he says. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Do you know what that means? Do you know what the lesson is for us? He didn't give up on Israel. He sent prophets. He gave them every measure of mercy. They rebelled. They rejected Messiah when he came. And even then, Jesus stood and wept over the city. And said, oh, Jerusalem... Do you ever notice in Scripture so much of the time there's a sense of awe and regard that when it's referred to, it says, Oh, Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem. That God cries out from his heart, but God hasn't given up on them. And he said there's coming a day when all Israel will be saved. And I don't know exactly how God's going to do every bit of that. But I know this, even when heaven and earth pass away, his word won't pass away. And he said all Israel will be saved. And the good news is, and the lesson for us is, if God didn't give up on Israel, baby, he's sure not going to give up on you. No matter what you've done, how much you've failed, God is not going to give up on you. Some of you ought to have got up and run around the building right there. Because you've done enough for him to give up on you. But he didn't give up on Israel, and he won't give up on you. Now, there's a third possible interpretation of this. Jesus pointed out the sign of the fig tree, and it having leaves on it, and He said, 
this generation won't pass. Was he referring to that, gener- that end time generation? Was he referring to Israel? Some people believe <clears throat> that he was promising that once Israel was restored as a nation, that he would come back before the end of that generation. Some, some people believe that. Now, I know the Bible said, and you, you read on just past where we stopped in the text, and we, we don't know the day nor the hour when he's coming, but we can be alert to the season when it's getting close, when it's getting near, and what's going on around us. Now, there are a couple of questions that arise with that. If you believe that from the restoration of the nation of Israel, that within a generation is coming back, within a generation Jesus is coming back, there are a couple of questions that arise. Number one, when do you start counting? Some people say you start counting in 1948. Some people say you start counting in 1967 with the Six-Day War that Israel fought where God God miraculously gave her victory over her enemies. So the first question is, when do you start counting? And the other question is, how long is a generation? And there's debate about that. And some people say a generation is 40 years. And some people say when you look at what we perceive as normal life expectancy as well as some of the writings of Moses... That with a generation, you look at a lifespan, you're, you're probably looking at somewhere between 70 and 100 years that we would expect for a normal lifespan that sometime within that generation. And I don't have the answer to all of those questions. As I said, Israel just celebrated 73 years on Friday. This week I was reading after a man who is... A Jew, he and his family live in northern Israel. He's a major in the Israeli army, at least in the reserve now. He's a very well-known tour guide. When groups come to the Holy Land to to take a tour, he's a very well-known tour guide. And he's also a Christian. And he told him, so he has kind of a unique perspective on things, being Jewish himself. And a Christian. But he said, he lives in northern Israel and he said, there are mornings when I go out on my back porch, my back deck with a cup of coffee to sit down. And he said, I look out, he said, my my back porch looks out on a beautiful valley. And he said, it's just, it's just gorgeous to look at. But he said, when I look out at that as beautiful as it is right now, he said, I think about what it may look like within a decade or two decades. Because he believes this. He's of this opinion that from the, the found, founding of, of Israel that within a generation. So that would mean within, sometime within the next decade or two that Jesus will return. And he said, when I look out on that valley, I know in a few years it may look very different because that valley that his back deck juts out on is the valley of Megiddo, the valley of Armageddon, where one day there will be a final battle as the nations of the earth gather against Israel and the blood will flow. But just when the devil has thought he th- thinks he has won, the Bible said that when Jesus comes back that time, that he's coming riding a white horse, and, the, and we're coming with him. Riding horses with him, the armies of the Lord, to execute vengeance. And Jesus will set his foot on the Mount of Olives and it will split in two. And he will set up a thousand year reign of peace to rule and reign upon the earth. (laughs) 
Now you can debate about which one of those ways you think is correct to interpret that passage of Scripture. But Jesus' main point was the sign of the fig tree. That when you see stuff happening with the fig tree, you know that my coming is near. And here's the, the final lesson for us. Put up my last verse. It's a familiar verse to most of us, but this is what the Word said. It said, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but encouraging one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. What is the day? That's the day of his coming. That's that last period of time. It may be more a season than, than one day, but it's, it, it's that day at the end. And so when the writer of Hebrews, whoever that was, we're not entirely sure. When the writer of Hebrews got to talking about this stuff and thinking about the day approaching. Somebody say the day approaching. I want to tell you something. The day is approaching. I said the day is approaching. The day is approaching. We've stepped into a place none of us have ever been before in our lifetime. The day is approaching. And his first concern was for the church being what the church is supposed to be. Listen, we don't know the day or hour. I'm not trying to predict that. I don't know what when Jesus is coming back. But I know we can see the signs of his coming. I know it's closer now than it's ever been. I know the day is approaching and as never before, it is time for the church to be what the church is supposed to be. It's time for the church to quit playing games and step into her place. We've played games at this. I'm not trying to scare you. He said, don't hang your head, lift up your head. I'm not trying to scare anybody. I'm not trying to scare you, but it is serious. <clears throat> and so, I don't know when he's coming. This guy, Jewish guy I was reading after, he said, I am fully expecting within the next 10 or 20 years. For Jesus to come. I don't know God's timetable with all of that. But I know we're close. This week, and we ought to live like we're close. We've carried on with everything else. Will you all hang on with me just a minute? One of the other things Jesus said in Matthew 24... He said, as it was in the days of Noah. Noah was a picture of an end time messenger, which is what we're supposed to be. And he said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be at the coming of the Son of Man. Men shall be eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. In other words... When Noah was preaching and building an ark and telling them that there was a flood coming, they were so wrapped up in their everyday lives, eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, they were so wrapped up in their everyday lives that they couldn't recognize what was going on. And he said, that's the way it'll be. Come on, somebody. He said, that's the way it'll be in the last days. People will be so wrapped up in their daily living that they don't even recognize what's going on and that's exactly where we are as it was in the days of Noah 
The day is approaching this week, and I'm, I'm done with this. This week, we had another scare, another panic, thanks to the media. We had another panic. This time, it wasn't over toilet paper. It was over gasoline. And people lined up at the gas pumps. <clears throat> and I, I understand, I, I'm not trying to be too hard. I mean, these days, it seems like anything can happen. And if I fill up with gas, you know, I'm, I'm going to use it eventually anyway. I, I understand that. I, I understood a little of that. What I didn't understand was people dragging in every other kind of container and trash bags and trying to put gas in that. I, I, did that, I thought that was... I thought that may be a little extreme. I know we laugh at that, but you know it's you know that really happened. Dragging in all these other kind of containers, trying to fill them up with gas because they're scared to death. And and something occurred to me. I'm talking about the church being the church. See, we've got to come to a place. That instead of people lining up at the gas station because they think, they think they're going to run out of gas. We need to have people lined up to get in the church because they realize we're running out of time. We're not just running out of gas, we're running out of time. I said we're running out of time. I don't apologize for the way I'm preaching. I'm preaching the gospel. He said in the last days, it says this in different places. In the last days, scoffers would come. People who just make fun. All those comedians, well, it's a free country. No, it ain't a free country anymore, baby, in case you hadn't noticed. And, uh, well, they can say what, you know, they're just comedians. They, most of those comedians think nothing is sacred. I'm telling you, there are some things that are still sacred. He said in the last days, scoffers would come. All that stuff, Jesus is coming. I've heard that all my life. The church has been saying that for years. And he hasn't come yet. He said, even when heaven and earth pass away, my word won't pass away. He said he's coming and he's coming. They can make fun of it all they want to. In fact... Let me close with this. I heard about one guy. I've not preached this. I might sometime. Sometimes we hear these sermon titles that are way out there. Jennifer says, don't you dare preach that. <laughs> I heard one guy one time preached a message called Gabriel is licking his lips. If you have ever seen a trumpet player... Right before he lays the trumpet to his mouth, he'll give it one of these. He'll lick those lips. And that guy preached a message, said Gabriel is licking his lips. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then those who are alive and remain shall be caught up together in the clouds with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Oh God, help us to understand. I don't guess what they're telling us right at the moment. 
guess we're running out of gas. But we are running out of time. We're running out of time. We're running out of time. And Jesus is coming. And there are too many who don't know him. not willing that any should perish but that all should come